Welcome everyone to another live edition of the video uh, program of Let's Talk America with host Shana Thornton. Of course, I am Shana, and here we offer exclusive conversations with the best and the brightest, the intriguing people as we cover the trending topics you want to know more about. And after all, being educated, motivated, and inspired is the name of the game for Let's Talk America radio. Thank you for everyone watching us live. If you're watching us on demand or replay, we encourage you to share this episode with someone you love. Tonight, we're talking about one of my favorite topics. We're talking about history. In particular, we're talking about the history of African-American women in the 1800s. Many of us may be familiar with some of the history of the 1900s or even dating back to um, African-Americans or as our plight in Africa. But as we came to the United States in the latter part of the 1800s and as slavery was being abolished, how much do you really know about the everyday life of the African-American family and in particular, the African-American woman? As many of you know, African-American women have been the beacon and the staple of communities and families for hundreds of years. But what exactly was the day-to-day -day task that they dealt with in the late 1800s? Well, I am no expert at it, even though I take a great interest in it. But we do have an acclaimed historian with us tonight who is an expert in African-American history, in particular women's uh, is her topic, women's uh, role throughout history and 1800s. She's going to have a great, lively conversation with us tonight. I do encourage you to take some mental notes and written notes as well because knowledge is power and we have to have an understanding of the truthful past to make sure we're shaping our present for a hopeful future. Dr. Tara White is with us. Dr. White, welcome back to LTA Radio. So excited to have you on again. You're one of my favorite guests. Thank you. It's great to be on again. It's great Thank to be Thank you. And Thank I, you. I enjoy it every time I come. So Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we, we have a tradition here on Let's Talk America Radio where we ask our exclusive guests to really briefly describe themselves. I've seen your resume. I know how uh, well written you are, um, how much you've achieved in your career as a historian, but I'd love to hear it from your point of view. And I'll tell you why, because, you know, I can read all of that, but what inspired you, what motivated you to really become an historian who focuses on African-American history? Uh, tell us your journey in two minutes or less. Two minutes or less, okay. All right, so um, I started out in science. Um, I ended up um, um, interning at uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and that's really kind of how I turned from science towards history. Um, okay. I, I finished my degree and I, Needed, needed somewhere to be and that was um, the place and it became a really magical place and I fell in love with history and um, I also fell in love with um, the ways that uh, museums actually present history to the public so that was that piece but there was another um, um, there was another um, um, introduction to black women's history and that was um as i became became interested in sorority oh. and um interested in delta sigma theta sorority and at that time i think um the the book was new so uh, i'm dating myself uh, uh paula giddings <laughs> in search of sisterhood had 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 been published like a year or so before you know, I, I, as I was coming to campus. So as I was coming to campus, that book was there and I was interested in Delta. So I read the book and it was amazing, you know, cause Giddings painted this um, just wonderful yeah. portrait of black women. And um, I became interested in um, not just um, um, Delta Sigma Theta, of course, that, that yeah. just sealed the deal for me, yeah. but um, also black women's history. And once I um, decided that I was going to graduate school in history, um, I, I, I went with a topic. One of the ladies from Birmingham who was a, an integral part of the um, civil rights movement there, uh, Mrs. Lola Hendricks, told me that I had a topic already, <laughs> told me. And uh, the good little Southern girl I, I was, I said, yes, ma'am. And so <laughs> um, I went to school knowing that I was gonna do my master's thesis on women in the civil rights movement. And so that was my introduction to black women's history, looking at black women um, and their roles in, 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 in the civil rights movement in Birmingham. And that just expanded um, once I, uh, and I continued to work and continue to research um, those women and what they did. And in fact, um, still doing some work on them. But also, um, I decided to go back to school 
um, some years later. And when I went back to school, I um, decided that I would move it back some because I was interested in the period right before um, the or before the civil rights movement, not right before, you know, the, the, the period where you had black hospitals and black colleges founded and okay. um, black institutions founded. And what I realized was that women were a huge part of that. And I know that was more than two minutes, so. Wow, I mean, so you have a fascinating professional journey that sounds like it's encouraged and inspired um, by a lot of personal passions. Is that true to say? That is true. I, I, I really did fall in love um, with, well, like, like I said, Delta introduced me to Black women's history and I was just so fascinated by it, I, you know, I, but I, did, I never, didn't see it as a profession. And once I got to the Civil Rights Movement, uh, Civil Rights Institute, I saw that I could actually um, parlay my interest because I, I was going to go to graduate school for public health. I'm glad, this year, I'm glad I didn't. But... <laughs> Tough, tough, tough job. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't go to graduate school for public health. But uh, anyways, uh, I was going to go to graduate school for public health, but um, I um, decided, you know, I really enjoyed this. And then I applied to graduate school um, and got an interview, you know, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, so uh, I was willing to go to old cold upstate New York and <laughs> Therefore, uh, you you've been up there. Oh yeah. Uh, be yeah. there for um, a couple of years. You know, the only little brown face in the village of Cooperstown for a minute. Yeah. And um, it was it was it was an amazing. It it really was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Um, it it changed. I mean, that was like the, that was it for me. That it was a lock. It was a lock. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, from there, looking at but but I had already also decided when I was in graduate school doing the master's in history and museum studies that um, my, the late, my, my history professor, um, the late Lanny Wright, um, Lanny was like, well, Tara, you know, I really think you need to keep going, you know, um, and I think you have the aptitude. I think you, you'll, you'll yeah. do fine in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Go back, go back for the PhD. And, and um, I did. And I'm grateful, I will say, and I, I sure speak for others that you did do it because it's always nice to have a fresh approach um, to a topic like history, right? And, and I think there are those who are fascinated with it, like myself, um, it's a personal interest, obviously you do it professionally, um, but there are some people that are turned off by it. And I think a lot of times, Dr. White, it's the approach um, that's given, right? And, and a lot of times, let's be frank, real talk for real people, um, it's the area of history that maybe people are highlighting or studying that they say, well, that doesn't quite fit me. But my father always says there's some component of history that will interest people. You just have to find it. And it's so much more than what's in a book, but really applying those lessons learned, even some of the pain to our current life. And that leads me to our first question for tonight. Again, we are focusing on African-American women, in particular, the life and the role um, and the impact they had in their communities um, in the latter part of the 1800s. Uh, 1800s, obviously, uh, a century that has so much history in it, world history, American history. But we are focusing on, again, African-American women. If you have any feedback, any questions for our exclusive expert, our in-house historian, please get those questions and comments in. She's going to tackle them on, okay? Um, but African-American women, and I'm thinking latter part, so let's focus on after the 1850s. Um, many of us have some idea of what um, slavery looked like here in the United States. And I say we have an idea. I'm not sure it's always the same um, in different communities or among different family members, if they have a true understanding. Um, there are those, you know, who would argue that sometimes individuals, millennials and younger may not really have a true idea or depiction what it was, but I certainly think some of the older generations may. And some of that is from mainstream um, entertainment, such as, right, Roots, that had certainly a lot of elements of truth to it. Obviously, we know that. Um, and other movies as well that's come out. But African-American women in particular, and I know this may be hard, but if you can, as simple as you can, describe the everyday life of an African-American woman in Charleston, South Carolina around 1860. What would that have looked like? Because as you know, slavery has not been abolished yet. 
right? It's on the brink, but it's not yet there. Um, what was her life like? And I think a question that some people may imagine, well, it hadn't been abolished yet, but were things possibly um, improving for perhaps someone that was in slavery then? I know the answer to that, but someone may say if things were getting better, but you and I know the political truth behind the, the Emancipation Proclamation. But tell us the everyday life of an African-American woman. Okay, so it, it depends on Okay, so when we think about slavery, we, we have to think about location. You know, Charleston was actually a city, right, and, and a major port. So life, uh, you know, the life of an enslaved person in an herbal, urban setting is going to be very different okay. than the life of a person, let's say, in um, over in the Sea Islands or in, um, if you say, um, somewhere um, in, in, else in South Carolina, right? Okay. And so that that's that's the other thing that you have to keep in mind that urban versus rural is going to play a part. Um, there are um, a number of ways, you know, uh, because now what we always consider is that um, do not consider is that you know African American men and women who are enslaved. Um, not they're not just work in the fields, you know, they have a lot of different kinds of skills. And so you'll see a lot more of these skilled um, people in urban settings, right? Mm -hmm. um, you'll see uh, skilled carpenters and um, other kinds of skilled laborers in urban settings. That's men. Uh, for women, you could see women who are being hired out to do um, things as, as, as different as dressmaking to, um, you know, um, um, uh, doing other kinds of domestic um, um, chores okay. for other people. Um, and, and, and in many cases, um, people did hire their um, enslaved people out to do other kinds of things. If you have people, you know, women who think, did things like made hats, you know, if people wore hats. And so, you know, um, if you had women who made hats or women, like I said, who sewed dresses or who were experts in, you know, fine, you know, fine gowns and that kind of thing, they would definitely be so be um, um, either um, uh, might be owned by. And, and this is the other thing we don't really get. They might actually be owned by a dressmaker. Right. Oh, wow. and, okay. Yeah might be owned by a dressmaker and that dressmaker have that person in the shop working with them. And so that that aspect of urban slavery is, like I said, a lot different from, you know, rural slavery. Of course, you have, you still have women who are, who are working in the fields and who are um, doing, um, um, you know, field work. And then you have women who are working in the houses and keeping, keeping houses. They're actually the personal assistants from the personal assistants to um, you know the master or mistress of a the mistress of a house um, women who keep the children women who um, cook the food women who take care of things like making clothes for um, these people because of of course um, you know it's not it's not the 20th century where you can go in the store and buy a dress right you know they go buy uh, fabric and they actually make whatever the person wants made or whatever. And so, you know, that, but, but now even that is about, you know, people, because when we, we talk about, we still talk, have to talk about class and think about, you know, these are, you know, the, the enslaved people to the wealthiest folks, right? Okay. Um, yeah. And so um, enslaved people to, you know, uh, people who are owned by, um, um, folks who are not as wealthy might still be in the fields, might be in the, you know, still be in the house, but doing some other kinds of things. And so um, there are a lot of um, different ways that that can play out. But I, you know, I, I like to tell young people when I'm teaching, um, because we use the term slavery loosely, yeah. right? And okay. we'll, well, you know, so-and-so is working me like a slave. And it's like, look, um, no one has a tag with your name on it. If nobody has a bill of sale with your name on it, you're not a slave, That's okay? Right. Um, if you have bodily autonomy, if you actually control what happens to your own physical self, right? You can control who, who, who touches you and who deals with you and whatever um, you, you know. 
um, if you have a baby, that baby belongs to you and doesn't belong to somebody else, okay? Because if you were enslaved, that baby doesn't belong to you. That baby belongs to um, whoever owns you, okay? And you have no control. You really don't have control over their lives. And so you have to keep in mind that um, these are the kinds of, of things, you know, your day as a, as a free person, you, you pretty much can, you know, of course we all have to go to work, right? Uh, so not all of our day is whatever we wanna do, but you know, you, you still have some control over the kinds of things you do for your day. Your day doesn't belong to you when you're an enslaved person, that belongs to somebody else. And so, uh, and, and, and those are the kinds of things and, and to control your destiny. Yeah. You don't have, as an enslaved person, you, you know, um, somebody else has control of your destiny, right? right? Um, and and, and what's, what's beautiful about though, those people is that those people understood that and, and they did a lot of stuff <laughs> to try to take control of their destinies from running away to, um, you know, they might set the whole damn field on fire uh, or the house, you know, or, you know, they did all kinds of stuff um, but but that was their way of trying to you know control their destinies um, during during the enslavement. Let me ask you this, and and you said that, and thank you for bringing up the point because I think so many times um, slavery was wrong. It's horrible. It's hideous. And I'm going on the record saying that, that there's no way you can justify and make that right. Mm -hmm. With that being said, you did say that there were plantation owners who were wealthier than others. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think so many times people sort of group it all together, but you're saying, no, they, they're ones who, again, had probably more property, um, just more wealth, uh, as things can look today for people in America around the globe. For the African-American woman, perhaps if she uh, worked in the home of a very extremely wealthy uh, landover or slave owner, mm -hmm. is it fair to say that perhaps, and, and this is, and obviously it's hard for us to pinpoint it, but Versus what you said, the more rural slave, right? That may be out somewhere more, maybe South Georgia around that time. Is it, is it, would it's fair to say that perhaps the woman that was in Charleston to a very wealthy family who slave owners would have had a life that was not as harsh or it's hard to say that? It's hard to say that because I mean, okay, they're not out in the field working from sun up to sundown, um, you know, um, doing um, excruciating physical labor, right? Being exposed to the sun, uh, blah blah blah. They're not doing that, but at the same time, um, they are. You know, imagine your entire day you're at somebody else's beck and call, yeah. right? And so, some Miss Ann is ringing the bell for you to come all day. I mean, it's 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 all day. You you gotta make sure Miss Ann is up. You gotta make sure she's dressed. You gotta make sure she's bathed. You gotta make sure she's fed. You have to make sure that she. You know, we didn't have air conditioning back then. I'm I'm just I'm I'm just talking in general generalities, but I want you to understand. You know, we didn't have air conditioning back in, and I praise God for whoever invented it. But um, you know, and so Miss, if Miss Ann was hot, you you gotta make sure Miss Ann stopped being hot. OK, um, your entire if you and, and especially if you're a personal slave, your entire day is is, is this person. It's, it's, it's waiting on this person hand and foot being on beck and call all day. You went to sleep. Most of the time you slept at the foot. You slept on the floor next to their bed so that if they um, needed you, you can get up and, and and do whatever. You know, if they had to go to the pot in the middle of the night, because uh, these are these are the times um most people now there were a few 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 people who had some indoor situations and it, it wasn't indoor plumbing in the way that we think it okay? okay okay but um they had some indoor situations but for the most part people um people went to the chamber part and wow. so you had to get up and go miss ann and she went and you had to empty her pot and clean her pot out and you know i, I mean it, it was a <laughs> yeah yeah well, whatever she had to do, you know, um, if Miss Ann was pregnant, you know, morning sickness. Yeah. So can you imagine, can you imagine cleaning up vomit all the time? I mean, come on. It, 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 and, 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 you, and I think you make a very good point. We cannot minimize or assume like, and, and you're right. And when people say they're being treated like a slave, you're right. That, that That's not really having a true understanding 
of how harsh and brutal and horrific slavery was. I want to talk about something that you dabbed in. We do have some questions rolling in, and I certainly want you to address those as well. I thank you, everyone. You're watching Real Talk presented by Let's Talk America Radio. I'm on air here, host and executive producer, Shana Thornton. Tonight, I have an, an amazing historian with us, a friend of this show, a friend of mine, Dr. Tara White. She is really breaking down and explaining the realities of the African-American woman here in the United States in the latter part of the 1800s. And slavery is a topic many people are familiar with. They may not know the ins and outs. And she's breaking that down in the everyday life of the African-American woman. Um, but you said your life did not really belong to their own, right? The African-American woman. She was owned by someone else. Let's talk about exactly what that means for the African-American woman at that time. Because if you had children, right, those children could be sold if you liked it or not, and no one likes that, we know that. Um, also, I I'm saying this, and, and you elaborate more, sexual assault, or how women in general were treated and perceived. So what talk to us about that. Sexual assault happened. I mean, you know, I, I joke, well, I shouldn't joke, but you know, it's a bunch of light-skinned folks running around here. We didn't come, we didn't come from the continent like that. And so, um, you know, my, and I say that, I say that loosely as a, you know, I, I'm the daughter of a light-skinned man, right? My daddy was, was a light-skinned guy. And so, you know, um, and he, he would always say he, well, he didn't understand how, how my grandparents ended up together, but she was like half white and, and he, and he was, he was a black man in Lowndes County. He, he just didn't understand how that happened. And, and the people in Lowndes County allowed that, but um, that was, that was um, no, they did not have bodily autonomy. And so if the slave owner desired them, then um, they, they had to deal with it. And so sexual assault. If, was if they had a husband and family or not regardless of whether you had a husband or family or not. And, and, and let, me, let me make this statement. In, some, in, in a lot of places, even after, so we, we're talking 18, right before, because you mentioned the, the, the date 1860. So that's right before the war, right? Yes. It starts in 1861. And then of course, you know, um, the wars 1861, 1865, and then slavery ends um, in 1865. Um, um, the Civil War ends in 1865, and then of course you have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But I, later, you know, 65, 68, 70. But the point I want to make is that you know African American women. Now, one of the things that is important for us to understand is that even into the 20th century, African American women were having to deal with the specter of of of, of racial of of of, of sexual violence. So this isn't something that ends with the enslavement. You know, this is something that carries over into um, the 20th century. And what I mean by that is this, you know, um, Danielle, um, Danielle McGuire, another historian, uh, chronicles this in her book at the dark end of the street. And she's talking about um, um, Rosa Parks and how Parks starts out. Now, when Parks starts out, you know, of course, she starts out 20 years before the bus boycott. Yes. Okay. And, and is an activist 20 years before. But the other thing um, that is important is that she's in, she's, she initially starts out in Scottsboro Boys in the 1930s, she and her husband trying to get them off for the, for the, um, the, the lie of rape, raping a white, right, raping two white women. Okay. So that's number one. But then she starts to, starts to investigate. She and some other women start to investigate the rape of black women, right, by white men. And that happened a lot in the South. But people say that um, that might not have, that happened. Um, and there were situations because, situations where um, black women were attacked by white men and, and, and really there was nothing, they had no recourse. And if their husbands, you know, in many cases, um, when we think about people um, going North, a lot of times, you know, we think about people going North because of this and that and whatever. Um, many cases, folks, folks went North because um, they went and shot Mr. Charlie who raped his wife. Um, the, the black man went and shot Mr. Charlie who raped his wife and they had to get black man out of town before he got lynched. Wow. And so, um, yes, because the truth is who was going to believe 
a black woman. And, and that goes back to that whole, but but still go back, goes back to that whole idea about, you know, black women and uh, the whole notion of, uh, of, of chastity and purity. And there's these whole set of ideas okay. that are created as a way to justify all these little light-skinned children running around the plantation, right? right. And so it wasn't that um, these men were just evil. Yes, I, and I'm saying that on the record. Um, and 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 taking it and, and going in and taking advantage of these women. But um, I but what ends up happening is there's this whole justification that black women are loose and they're wanton and they're 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 all whores and and that kind of thing. And that is the that that's right. And so that is the justification. Well, you know, she, she, he, she master so and so just couldn't resist because she was loose and she's a whore. Huh. You know, coming on to him and whatever, whatever. Blaming the victim. Yeah, and so that, but that idea about black women's um, sexual purity, those ideas even travel. They travel into the late nineteenth post slavery and into the twentieth century. And in fact, when we, um, you think about people like Ida B. Wells, right? Yeah. And, and and you mentioned her yeah. earlier. Uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett was a um, um, uh, a famous um, club woman. She was a suffragette. She was also an anti-lynching crusader. And a powerhouse and journalist. And a journalist. More than any, more, more than anything else. She was a, she was an educator and a journalist. And 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 but Wells Barnett is, you know, noticing that, you know, one of the the lie, and she calls it a threadbare lie of of rape is the issue that um, people are constantly going back to is the reason these men are being lynched and she realizes it's, it's economic const um, competition. But um, there, she went abroad and she was actually, went to England and, and, and Europe to talk about anti-lynching. And one of the women, uh, uh, one of the folks in the South actually sent a letter over saying, don't believe a word she's saying, you know, and black women can't be trusted in the way and they're all whores and they're all, you know, almost prostitutes and whatever, and they have no. And so, um, you know, one of the things that happens, you have these women in outrage and that's not really, you know, some historians in the past have said that that was the reason that you have the meeting that leads to the creation of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896. Okay. But that's one reason. There are a whole lot of things going on at the time. That's just one reason, one more reason. What it's 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 just one more thing um, to add to that. Um, um, need for African-American women and, and organized women, women who are in club organizations to come together to create one um, national organization. And, but, but that's an, or that's in, that's something that goes, goes on even in the 20th century. Once you see the, the laying down of Jim Crow, you know, and, and it's codification in the city, the municipal codes in cities across the North and South, um, um, in the cities in the South, um, in places in the South, if you had public accommodations and if there are, for example, bathrooms, there are bathrooms for men and women. So there are bathrooms for men, there are bathroom for, bathrooms for ladies, and there are colored bathrooms, right? For both men and women. Or if there is a bathroom that's specifically for black women, it's for colored women. And ladies is always assumed to be white ladies, okay? Yeah. And, and regardless of, even in, in this time, regardless of her standing, her education, her, her she, could, she could have been wearing a, a uh, a bronze chastity belt. Um, black women were not considered ladies. Ladyhood was white women and white women only, right? And so, um, but that is, that it, that was the power of race on, wow. and, and the impact of race on, on gender. So we have racism, Dr. White, obviously coming through loud and clear, and also sexism. And a brutal, harmful, devastating form 
of sexism, not to be taken lightly. And you are watching Real Talk. We have the one and only African-American studies historian on with us, Dr. Tara White. And she is breaking down so much information that many people do not realize or rarely talk about. And they were talking about the latter part of the 1800s and the role and impact of African-American women on their families and in communities overall. We've got your questions. We're gonna to get to them right now. Um, but Dr. White, I did want to thank you for really explaining a lot that went on in the 1900s right that we now see we know that in the early part of 1900s and then we wonder well where did that come from and you've explained beautifully only you can as an acclaimed historian that it did not start overnight these these things these myths these harmful lies started then and they sort of catch hold and keep going um and clearly it's a sick twisted justification of enslavement of rape of devaluing human life in African-American women. I wanna to get to our first question. We wanna get you to please keep those questions coming in, those that are watching us in the live stream. The first question comes from Ms. Ashley. She says, why do you think that generic history books often skip over African-American life in the late 1800s? It seems that the focus is often slavery, reconstruction, and then they jump over to the Harlem Renaissance. She has a great point. I think so many people sort of what they know about the African-American experience does seem to sort of, there was slavery and, and how in depth they know about that sort of varies from person to person, right? And then she's right, it's sort of reconstruction, their names given out, we're gonna talk about reconstruction. I notice those names tend to be men. I, I've never noticed a women's name on, I want you to bring that up for us later. I mean, then she's right, it seems to be Harlem Renaissance. You know, and I know, especially historian, there's so much more, but she has a point. Uh, why do you think that the generic, general mainstream history books sort of pick and choose? Well, mainstream history books, um, and so we're, 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 I will say that college history texts are getting and have gotten, well, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of them have gotten better. There, there, are, there are more people writing um, um, history textbooks, who, you know, for college students who are, um, who, who, who have a, a, a broader um, um, view and they're they're looking at the most current scholarship and whatever. Uh, I remember when I um, started teaching um, here actually and um, where I currently work, which is a place that sh shall not be named. And um, and and my current employee employer, um, well, the textbook that they were using okay. for U.S. history. Um, I started reading it and, and I looked at, you know, it had all kinds of craziness. And I was like, what the, what the heck? Come on. Anyways, um, I get, got rid of that textbook and we chose something else because um, the person, you know, had clearly not been keeping up, keeping up with the scholarship. I would say that African-American history as a discipline has probably been one of the hottest disciplines in history for the last uh, about 30 years. Okay. No joke. And so um, what happens though, is that that doesn't filter down to the textbooks, right? Exactly. And it doesn't, it, and, and especially on K-12, oh God, the K-12 textbooks are ridiculous. But um, th yeah, they, they're just, it, it, they're almost seeing, it, it, should, it should be a sin. People should go and do penance for the, the K-12 textbooks. But mm -hmm. um, college level textbooks- the majority of Americans see, right? Everybody does not go on to college. We know that there are statistics that backs that up. Mm -hmm. So most people are seeing that K through 12 curriculum. That's right. And that has to do, um, and that's, those curriculum committees are very, um, believe it or not, are uh, very political. And they have been for a long time, especially in the South. And one of the things you see in the late 1890s <laughs> and the early 1900s is, you know, people take up the, the cause of the lost cause, white women actually take up that cause and decide that they're going to make sure that Southern textbooks reflect the truth about the South. And so um, they are able to make sure that they have representation on the state textbooks committees. And up through not too long ago, uh, uh, even in the state of Alabama, you still had a representative from the United Daughters of the Confederacy on the state textbook committee right um making sure that you know there's there's that that southern um version of of history and and, and you know i i use the term I, I put air quotes around southern because 
hell, I'm Southern, right? I was born and raised in the South. And, you know, I will say that, um, you know, the women that we were, you know, talking about earlier from the late 1800s, Ida B. Wells, um, and, and other women like Mary Church Terrell and Margaret Murray Washington, they were all Southerners, right? All of these women were Southerners. And they were very um, conscious about um, their Southern identities. And um, they did not divorce themselves from that. You know, um, they were not um, taken to the, um, they, they were not going to allow these other folks to say well, they're the only Southerners. And like, no, you don't, you don't, you're not the only people in the South. You don't own, you share the South with us now, right? And so, um, and, and it's important that all of those stories are told. So, so that's, that's really kind of how you end up with um, these horrible textbooks um, on the K-12 level. On the college level, like I said, it, the more current scholarship is, you're gonna get better textbooks. But, but, um, um, but there has been such amazing work done in that period between, you know, 18, I, and I, I, you know, study uh, these, these women in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era between about 1870 to 1890 and then 1892, you know, depending, depending on what you, you know, in the South, it could go 1920, it could go 1930. Um, but what I will say is these ladies, um, um, these people are um, very conscious about, you know, their identity and, and want to make sure that, that um, their Southern, um, you know, the, that Southern Black people are represented. And you see the scholarship, um, so much scholarship that, have, that has come out over the past uh, 20 years on right. that period um, with, and, and even more scholarship. I, those three ladies I named, there are new books, like within the last uh, few few um, um, weeks, uh, or well, the last few months, there have been new books published on all three of those ladies. Ida B. Wells, right. um, Michelle Duster, her great granddaughter just did Ida B. the Queen. And we're excited about that. Um, Mary Church Terrell, Allison, and Allison knows that I know her, uh, but she's she's a historian at um, University of Delaware, nice. and Allison um, did the book new book on C.C. Militant on Mary Church Terrell, and then um, there's Sheena Washington, uh, Sheena Harris, Sheena Washington, Sheena Harris over at Tuskegee, who did book on Margaret Murray Washington, so, yeah. you know, uh, and that, I just got that book last week. So, you know, amazing scholarship, but, but it's, been, it's been coming over the last few years. Women have been putting, and, and, and more black women historians yeah. have been putting this work out. Yeah. And so, um, so there's, there's a lot to put in there. You know, one of, um, one of my favorites is, is um, oh, oh, and, and speak, speaking of black women, let me not forget, you know, there's a, the history of black women. Um, History of Black Women in America by um, Callie Gross and, okay. and Remy Berry, you know, that, that just um, dropped not too long ago, you know, looking at um, a, a much broader um, thing. But, but again, Black women are putting out this yeah. amazing work and they're doing this, this great work um, during this, for, for this period. Yeah. And so, you know, you've, you've had good stuff during this period from, from people like, um, you know, one of my favorite historians, you know, I, I kind of fangirl, um, Tara Hunter, who um, did, um, um, did, a, did a work looking at um, African-American women in um, Atlanta and, mm -hmm. and during, that, during that time, mm -hmm. right? And that, that was a game changer for how we looked at women during that period. Mm -hmm. And she's she's come back with another book looking at um, black marriage, you know, um, mm -hmm. during the um, time um, slavery to reconstruction, through reconstruction. So, uh, you know, women are, women are, black women historians are out there doing that work. I love and, it. Um, it it's, it's some amazing stuff. Yeah. So. I, I love it because representation is key. You know that. And I think that's why we push, I think most reasonable people push um, a diverse um, instruction, if you will, and creation and productivity mm -hmm. on all sides, because not mm -hmm. only, and I'll take the entertainment industry, right? Not only those who are in the movies, but it has to be ones writing scripts. It has to be diversity on all levels. So you can certainly get um, different angles. And when it comes to history, no one knows that better than a historian, 
right? You need the truth to be told and that truth um, has to be objective and having representation, having diversity allows that truth to be told in the manner that we can trust 100 years later, like and we're people, talking now. People need to know, people have to have the context. Um, there have been a couple of situations and I won't get specific because I, if I got more specific, people will know. And then, you know, I might have to, I might have to, you know, be cussing at folks. But um, um, there, are, there have been a couple of situations where, you know, you've had folks write stuff and you're like, wait a minute, who wrote this, right? And then you're looking, you're like, oh, okay, let me write so and so and say, listen, uh, I need you to, yeah, because I, mm, I don't have, I'm not have a part. I do not have a problem writing people to say that no, this is not. <laughs> no, you 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 were way off on this. You need to retract this, or you need, yeah, don't write this. Just 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 leave that to somebody else who, <laughs> who has expertise in that area. And I've had to do that. Yeah, and, and 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 that's so key. That's why we have to be able to vet things for our own. And I think hopefully that's what education helps each of us do. Right? It's about uh, making sure you're getting the full picture. And that can't just be K through 12. That can't just be with our amazing educators. And I think we have some hardworking men and women out there educating our K through 12. But you know, and I know both products of the school systems, right? That there's only so many hours during a day that that teacher has in front of that child. And when they go home and, and, and include their parents that agree, there's some that don't agree. The teacher cannot stop in the school. It has to be beyond that because let, let's go here. Even if you've got everything in the resources and assets and the books that you need mm -hmm. to teach, mm -hmm. he cannot possibly have all the time in the world to teach all there needs to be. And so I do think parents have to take an interest in, in seeking historians and experts like you, listening to podcast programs like ours and others to really get that information. I, I want to dig deeper in something you brought up and you brought up the reconstruction period, which is, um, obviously a, a period that has been written about. I've, I've read about it, knew about it as a child. Um, many see it as, as some have interpreted as a great time of American history. I'd love to know your take as a historian and, and the lack of role or inclusion of the African-American woman. And, and talk to us, when I say reconstruction, many of us have heard the term Dr. White, but talk to us right now about who could vote, who couldn't vote, um, and how all that came into place, because you know there have been um, some some first time pioneering moves that have were made. Georgia has its first African American um, senator. They'll say, but they said there there was well, there were some during Reconstruction. But did everybody get a chance to vote? Did African American women like you and I did we get to vote? And and just talk about Reconstruction and its impact for today. And so um, African American. Um, men actually during Reconstruction were just getting the right to vote. And and now let me say this, um, and this is a huge deal and it sets up a huge fight because um, white women who had started, you know, kind of coalescing, you know, we, we use the uh, um, the bellwether of, or, or we use the, the um, date 1848 and we look at the Seneca Falls um, um, meeting in upstate New York and think about um, the women's movement uh, uh, for, uh, well, the women's movement, you know, starting there, right, uh, with the Declaration of Sentiments with people like Susan B. Anthony and, and, and those ladies. But I will say that um, um, African-American women have been talking about um, ideas about freedom and um, ideas about you know who belongs to the nation state okay. and, and 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 being represented in the nation state. They've been talking about this for a long time, um, and 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 in a bunch of scholarship. You know, I won't even go through all the different folks who are, who have been who have written about this. People like S Elsa Barkley Brown and some other okay. folks. You know, African American women are involved in the conversations about you know what uh, freedom is going to be. And uh, what what happens though is that they don't have a they don't have a voice you know they don't have a voice at the at the ballot box okay because um, really what they're pushing for um, during Reconstruction is to make sure that African Americans have a right to the ballot box um, so you know the thirteenth fourteenth amendment actually was supposed to punish people from for for 
interfering with people's rights, <laughs> access to the, to the ballot, right? And, it, but it didn't, it didn't go far enough. And, and, and the truth is it wasn't enforced because, you know, congressional representation in, in most of the South should have been <laughs> affected by this. But anyways, um, so um, the 15th Amendment had to come. And like I said, there's a huge fight between white women who thought that this was their time and they actually should have gained the right to vote then and African-American men. So it, it takes um, a much longer time. So, so um, that sets white women up for the next fight and the next big fight for them. Um, Anti-slavery really was one of their fights. Now I have to say that. And so um, fight for women to have, you know, fuller, fuller rights and anti-slavery was their fight. Once they get to the 15th Amendment and they're not included, then that sets them up for the next um, next movement, and that's the movement for suffrage. But um, African American women are often are, are often pushed out of the suffrage movement. They're all not included. There, I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. And part of this is really about trying to bring in the Southern contingent of uh, women into, okay. into the, the suffrage movement because they understand, um, these Northern white women understand that if they don't um, pull, the, they have to pull the South in or they don't have a national um, case, right? And so that's right. And so, um, but, but what they do is they trade Right, and so they make the decision, a very conscious decision, to not really talk about um, African American women, or not really bring Black women into this conversation because they are capitul capitulating to, uh, you know, racist Southern white women. And so, uh, yeah, and I did say racist Southern white women. And and so, um, what you have is um, you do have Black women who are very much. Um, you know, moving for suffrage. And, and, okay. and um, in fact, in Alabama, we have a woman by the name of Adela Hunt Logan, who works at Tuskegee, who is one of the founders of the National Association of Colored Women, who was a member of the Tuskegee Women's Club with, with um, Margaret Murray Washington. Okay. Um, this woman um, um, is involved with suffrage and, and make sure that suffrage is a part of the conversation from day one. So 1896, you know, th their meeting, they're, that's one of the things that's on the um, record that they, they want to actually um, deal with, right? From day one. Um, so it's not that these women don't have any in any um, ideas or nor um, it, you know they they they're not interested in suffrage. They they are, but white women understand. White women in the South understand suffrage in a different way. They understand suffrage as a way to counter well well the the remaining black folks that were there because they understood that you know at the turn of the, um, the one big thing that's happening in the late 1890s uh, end of reconstruction early uh, progressive period okay. and that black is that black men are being disfranchised and so um, you have the the Mississippi plan which allows um, these uh, uh, states in the south in the deep south to re rewrite their constitutions okay. and their state constitutions and they they're in this um, they're in this tizzy because they're trying to make sure that the ballots are pure and you know some of the the language that we hear today, I don't care what anybody say is, and I'll put my, I'll put my paycheck on it. It's the same language. Um, well, we want to make sure that voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud is rampant. We want to clean the ballot. We want to make sure that a clean and fair election happens. And so they do. They do that by um, instituting things like poll taxes, um, no. the grandfather clause. If your father, uh, if, if your grandfather didn't vote before the war, and you know, we're Southerners, the war is the, the Civil War. Um, then Dr. White, how, wait, if, if slavery was legal. Ah, yes. So, so, how would so, they have, it. so, so it was you, set up. So you get it, that's right. And so um, if they're not voting before the Civil War, um, they, they, they can't vote. And then finally, um, 
literacy tests and literacy tests um, pretty much, you know, based on the um, reading of the um, constitution and, and being able to satisfy some registrar person who may or may not be literate him or herself, well himself, because it's mostly men, may not, may or may not be literate himself. But anyways, and so what you have is the setup for disfranchisement and they write that into these constitutions um, in the early 1900s. And so you're riding into um, a wave of, um, um, of, of, of things that are um, devices that are created and, and barriers that are created to African-American political participation, especially in the South. Now, at the same time, like I said, there still are a few people who are able to pay, either pay the poll tax or they're able to read well enough or whatever. And so they'll get through, right? But now that still does not include, you know, black women are still not a part of that number. And, and they're still not a part of that number until later. Um, but white women understand that there's still a few African-American males who are able to vote and, and have access to, to the ballot. And so they wanna make sure that they are voting because the, some of that is really a counter to African-American men voting. Now, am I saying that's the only reason that, that white women wanted the right to vote? No, they wanted the, the right to be able to um, elect people who are going to represent their interests as well. They wanted to be able to um, influence policy and legislation, especially around things like, you know, children and family, you know, issues that are important to families, right? Um, and so it's, it's not really that uh, they're just trying to, to do, you know, just, just to counter black men's votes, but that is one of the reasons. And, and that's not, you know, that's not Tara White's, you know, uh, version, that's their own. That's what they're, you know, in, in their, um, in their literature and, and, and their, um, um, in, 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 in the promotional material they have written to talk to talk to other white women about why they need to sign up for the um, suffrage movement in, in the South that, that starts about the 1890s, you know. Um, that's really the reason, you know, it's not about, um, it's not about, uh, you know, I just really need policy. No, uh, it's, it's, you know, we can actually counter the, the, the votes of these people and make sure that, you know, um, we, we're the counterweight to that. And so um, that's, that's, that's really what you start to see. Black women are not um, voting in any, any serious numbers in the South. Um, 1920 doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, and, and I will say that, you know, 19th Amendment is great, it's wonderful, but, it, you know, it doesn't have a huge impact on um, African American women um, being able to vote. And I'm, am I saying that no Black women are? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. In fact, in Montgomery, Alabama, um, and I looked at the voter rolls and as early as 1924, um, there are African American women who are registered to vote. Most of these women are women who are um, um, in the um, upper class, Black women, um, women who are connected with, um, here in Montgomery, more often than not, women who are connected with Alabama State University. And they are on faculty or they are um, 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 educators themselves or, you know, it, it, it's one of those kinds of things. So there are a few Black women who are voting, but not in any consistent numbers. But what this does for Black women Black women are like, oh, 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 okay, let's, let's, let's get it together. And so you start to see Black women push for um, voter registration, push for the extended fan franchise. You start to see Black women enroll and um, become a part of NAACP chapters and whatever. You start to see Black women um, um, in it, it you know, it push for an expanded uh, franchise. And so the, this is the period then, I know I know we were gonna start, stop late, late 1800s, but you know, it's not until like the 1930s, well, 
into the 1930s, then you see black women step in and start registering people to vote. You see the, the likes of people like, um, um, believe it or not, this is when you see the likes of people like Rosa Parks um, become members and involved with NAACP chapters. Um, this is when you see um, women, uh, there's a woman in Birmingham by the name of Indiana Little, Little whose brother had been in World War One, and she she led a contingency of black teachers down to the courthouse in Birmingham to say, we're gonna register. Our, our men have gone off to war. They fought to make this world safe for democracy. And so we have a right. We're, we're, the, we're the widows, we're the daughters, we're the sisters, we're the wives. Ask of 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 these um, of these veterans, and so we're going to go and vote. And uh, they all got put in jail, all of them. Uh, so this is when um, all these names of people you think about in the 1950s. See, these women have a long. There's a long thing. Um, this is when you have people like um, Amelia Boynton Robinson right? Um, step into the fray. Uh, she and her husband are in, involved with um, the Dallas, with the NAACP and Selma first, and then the Dallas County Voters League, right? And so 1930s, 1930s, they're starting to, to, to encourage, she, she gets registered to vote, she starts encouraging other people to register to vote. And so, you know, the, it, it, it just lights a fire, under black women in northern states, you have black women who are who have been longtime Republican Party uh, people who who become Republican Party officials, and so they start to climb in the party, right? And 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 in party leadership, and so you see some of that happen as well, um, and um, and the rest is you know like I said, but but back to the late eighteen hundreds. Um, the, the, the 1890s is when Black women are, are, are really starting to, uh, are really doing some amazing work. You know, they're starting to organize into clubs. Um, they're starting to create these amazing institutions and help to create these amazing institutions. Black people are building churches and women are a huge part of that. Um, Black women are building, helping to build hospitals. Black women are helping to build um, colleges um, and universities because this is, you know, you, you start to see the colleges start uh, 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 begin in the 18, um, 1860s and, and they're still going, at, you know, people are still creating Black colleges in the 1890s. Um, so, you know, you see an amazing array of work and they're doing, uh, it, it's, it's dizzying the amount of work that these women are doing. I, it's, it's, it's incredible. And you see, like I said, women like Ida B. Wells step up to the plate and start pushing um, for anti-lynching um, legislation. And that's another reason they realize they have to, they need the right to vote. They need to, to be able to vote, <laughs> vote out people who are, are, are um, blocking anti-lynching legislation and people who are, um, um, you know, basically, um, office holders, Ku Klux office holders. And so they're trying to vote because there were there really were people who, who were actively endorsed by the Klan and, and, and ran for, for office and, and won office. And so, um, oh yeah, oh yeah. And so they want to they wanted be able to have an impact on the political life of their cities and towns and states and, and the nation. And so you have women like uh, Ida B. Wells and women like Mary Church Terrell and women like Margaret Murray Washington who are um, doing amazing stuff during this time and who are pushing uh, in a bunch of different directions. Now, when we talked about, and I wanna make a distinction because now the majority of black women during you know the 1890s 1870s 80s and 90s the majority of black women are in the south are in the south number one okay because the majority of black people are in the south okay so that's number one number two the majority of these women are uh, are not college educated that is a tiny 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 percent of of these folks okay they're amongst but the that, but dr white wouldn't that also be true for white women of that time period that's correct? right that's okay. right that's right and in fact um 1890s is when they're going to college as well i see they're they're yes right 
right? And so you start- That's overwhelmingly majority of American oh, citizens. No. Oh no, oh no, oh um, no. But you start to see them go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the, um, you start to see, um, you know, those, those professions that are primarily from educators, to um, nurses and and those uh, professions, you know them to get educated in those in those areas. But um, the majority of Black women during this time are um, they're either working with their husbands and families as sharecroppers, or they are domestics. Okay, that's that's the vast majority of them. But now I, I keep I, I want to make a point. You know. When we think about those of us who are familiar with the club women, we know that you know the National Association's um, theme was lifting as we climb, right? That was their motto. And they understood that um, in the eyes of um, America, right? And, and, and especially white America, that they were, um, they were black first and women second. Okay, and so um, their plight um, was tied up with all of these washerwomen, all of these sharecropper women and washerwomen across the South. That um, their their plight was tied up with theirs. Okay, and so they um, had to actually do um, some things that would actually would help to lift up them and, and, and lift the entire race. These, this was the, 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 the early generation of, of um, well, well, actually this was probably the second or third generation really of what we call race women, okay? And race women, uh, people who are working for the betterment of black people as a whole. Um, these, these women were amongst those. Wow, so it sounds like there was a very important role as an African-American woman during this time period. It's Real Talk for Real People. I do encourage you as we begin to wrap up this exclusive, very informative and enlightening conversation with the one and only historian, Dr. Tara White. Um, of course, she is an educator, um, an educator on the college level, and she spent years of her professional career researching um, and highlighting African-American history, in particular, the female's role, the Black woman's role in that history. And it's such a, a large, large part to it. Um, real talk for real people, and this is a topic that makes very um, many people uncomfortable. But I think if we're going to talk about the experience of the African-American woman in the late 1800s, we've got to bring this up. Um, I, like you, have seen some of the mainstream movies that have come out. Um, such as Queen, and I, and I can't recall exactly the time period of Queen, but we're talking about obviously the same lifestyle generally for the African-American woman. And also Sally Hemings, when we know, of course, that is with Thomas Jefferson, okay? Much early. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the C word. I want to talk about colorism. And it has been a topic um, that has been covered and sort of touched on in the last few years here in the United States. And I can't help but think as an African-American woman here in 2021, if that conversation is being had in 2021, as it was being had as I was a child in the 80s and the 90s, it had to be, of course, a very much alive and unfortunately probably thriving. And I want you to clarify that for me, not me, I'm not a historian. In the late 1800s, we're talking about the brink of slave branding, Emancipation Proclamation. We're talking about Reconstruction. We're talking about a very hard life of sharecropping for millions of African-Americans in that latter part, 1890s, moving forward, going into 1900s. But define colorism for those that may be watching us that may not be familiar with that term and tell us how prevalent it was. And do you think, and I know you're a historian, you're like, well, not necessarily a sociologist or a psychologist, but what sort of emotional impact could that have had on all women, if the woman was darker skinned, if she was lighter brown skinned, or if she was considered light skinned African American. Because I think as we explore our history, as people become educated and more in tune with their history, um, we do have to address, Dr. White, some of the emotional trauma of it. Because I think that's how we, in your historian, you know it better than I did, again, you have a better understanding of the context of what we are talking about. And then I think then do we get the human side of history to see why, okay, how did that impact her? How, and how, how resilient could it continues to show 
these women in that light. But talk to us about that. And, and if you can tie it also into um, some of the education and, and some of you had mentioned in Alabama, there were few women who could did it, but they tend to be in an upper socioeconomic echelon. But colorism, was it around in, in late 1800s? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's funny that you um, mentioned that because, um, you know, one of the things that there was a the movie um, there was a, a movie done not too long ago, and it was a, really about um, the 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 movie self made about um, um, Madam C J Walker, and that was one of the things that was brought up. And that eh, I, I don't think that was the issue with her and Annie at all. But it was Netflix, uh, right? They did that production. Yeah, yes. did that. yeah, and and that was not um, that was not accurate historically that with that relationship. However, <laughs> so, Hollywood, so well, Hollywood had its way somewhat with that. Hollywood always has its way and historians, you know, we always get our, you know, Hollywood is always going to have its way um, people. So they get a hold of your book and they, they, yeah, just know that. Hollywood. <laughs> But um, colorism was real. Um, you know, one of the things that you see, okay, so um, some of these women, even with some of these women, you can see, you know, some of them tend to be, tended to be lighter skinned uh, because of their relationships that, that they were um, like Mary Church Terrell's um, folks were um, fathered, her father was fathered by uh, a white guy and, you know, and a black mother. And so that is how, you know, she was extremely fair um, skinned woman. And, um, and in fact, in some cases, depending on where she was um, in her early life, she could really uh, kind of pass. Um, the woman I mentioned from Alabama, Della Hunt Logan, very fair skinned, um, um, actually would go into and out of um, suffrage meetings. In fact, there was this huge um, suffrage meeting in New Orleans at one point, and um, she was able to kind of go in and out and mingle and whatever. Um, and people didn't really know that she was black. So right? let, me, let me ask you this, and you are doing a great job of explaining, but I'm, I'm asking because we'll talk, someone's out there thinking. Mm -hmm. We've seen that in movies such as Queen, where it was insinuated. Um, about that, and you're probably more familiar with Queen, obviously one of the grandmothers of Alex Haley, the award-winning Arthur historian himself, as you know. Um, but so that happened. There were African-American women who, of course, were biracial. And I think at that time, am I correct, was, was the proper name, what they call a mulatto? Is that correct? Is that what they call them? So they, you're saying that's not just that's not just a Hollywood myth. You're saying there were biracial individuals, women and men, that possibly attempted to pass and did successfully pass as Caucasian? There are a bunch of people who passed. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's funny because um, there was a, um, oh God, um, I forget his last name, Broyard, I, 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 I um, but he was a, um, if I'm not mistaken, he was a journalist. And then his daughter um, started, he died and his daughter was kind of looking through his stuff and trying to find um, stuff. It actually kind of stumbled on some letters or some correspondence with, with some family members in somewhere else and, and, and talked to the folks and she thought they were white and they were black. Um, and so yes, passing is real. It happened. Um, there are a bunch of people who are lost. You know, when when we I, I do uh, I'm really involved with genealogy group, and there are folks who you know go and you know they're never found again um, because they have to sever those ties with their. Uh, they had to sever those ties with their family. But yeah, passing was passing was real. I mean, people really did pass. Um, and and, and, really and I, I want to interrupt just to get you to address this part as you're doing a great job with this conversation. So if they, it, it appears, felt there was a need and a benefit, right? I think that's fair to say, right? Not condemning these individuals because I'm, I'm not walking in their shoes, but seeing there was a need to, right now as a historian, put on your psychologist or sociologist hat, what sort of emotional impact because I'm thinking if you are attempting to pass and pretend, let, let's be real, that's what they're doing, not condemning, because again, I'm sure there was a whole different mindset back then. But if you're pretending to be someone you're not, apparently, Dr. White, you're not 
okay with being an African American? Uh, there were a lot of people who were not okay with being an African American. And there were a lot of people who were not okay with the strictures, you know, societal strictures that they um, had to live with. Think about if you were a black woman and you couldn't try on clothes, you could not, um, you know, there was so many things. If you wanted to go to a restaurant and, and be seated with your family, have dinner, you could not do that in most places in the South, unless that, that restaurant was a black owned restaurant. You know, we, we, they've made a huge deal about the green book, right? And so, you know, letting you know where, which places you could go um, to actually, um, uh, and you won't be mistreated, right? And so there were a lot of folks who, you know, they wanted to be able to go and instead of going to the back door of a restaurant, because that's pretty much what happened. They had a window, little something where if you wanted to order and uh, order a sandwich, right? Or a hamburger or some French fries, you went to the black back door to this little window and you ordered your hamburger and French fries and you, they gave it to you, you paid for it and they gave it to you out the window and you went on about your way. You could not um, um, actually um, sit in a restaurant and eat your food. Um, with, with um, you know, and like I said, there were a certain, you know, few, few uh, restaurants that were, that had Black clientele. Um, my grandmother's mother, as a matter of fact, was um, an enterprising woman out of Bullock County, Alabama. She, she and her father, she had been a cook for some white folks in Bullock County, Alabama. She gathered up her formerly enslaved father and went and decided that she was gonna move to Montgomery, to the Cap City, and they were going to um, start over. And so she um, went to my grandmother tell this, tells this, I mean, just, uh, story about you know how her mother would go to the city dump and she would find these dishes and she would she would clean them and scald them off and whatever and she would serve dinners to people on the train and um so because again black people could not you know the dining car on the train they couldn't eat in the dining car on the train so they would want some dinner they would want something to eat and so she would um serve serve food to them or they wanted a cold drink and so she had this cold drink stand she just happened to fall in love with this man this big black man who worked for the railroad and um that that was the end of that story, you know, and that's, that's my grand, my, my granny's father. And they had a house near the train, um, near the railroad, um, near the Western Railroad, and um, they had a duplex house. And so on one side, they lived. On the other side, they actually had borders. And uh, those borders, because they couldn't get hotels anywhere else. And so, and they couldn't sleep in the sleeper car on the train. And so those borders would stay there and my great grandmother would serve dinner, which was lunch. You know, they called lunch dinner and, and dinner supper, right? Southern, Southern people. And so um, she um, would serve dinner to the borders, but also serve dinner to, you know, anybody else in the community who wanted to come and sit down and have a meal, right? And so it was those kinds of establishments that kind of filled those those gaps of um, um, people wanting to to do that. But but those folks um, weren't really able to 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 do a whole lot. They they and so. Anyways, I I I, I veered off. But um, you had a lot of folks who wanted that experience, and they were light enough, and people didn't know. And so they would waltz in and, and get, you know, try on dresses and whatever and go on. Nobody ever knew, no one, no one was the wiser that they were a black woman, right? But how, how does that, but, and I have to ask this. And so you're saying typically for someone to be able to do that, they would have to typically move away from a hometown or home city that where people could recognize them, obviously, who would have known they were biracial. So, so let's go into the interaction, maybe with those that could not pass, for Caucasian um, and, and talking about colorism because there were those who could pass and those could not, right? Of this time period, was there tension? And I'm only assuming this and, I, and I'm not a historian like you, but was there tension perhaps among 
those who do vary on a spectrum with complexion as African Americans and Hispanics do. Um, was there a tension? Was there conflict? Or is that something, in all fairness, we'll talk to real people that maybe some people are exaggerating? Um, or would you say as a historian, no, it's pretty accurate, the depiction that mainstream media now is beginning to highlight of the past. And some continue to argue the present. Well, well, now they, they've been talking about colorism for a while because, I mean, you know, we think about uh, if we're thinking about mainstream media, we're thinking about, um, uh, I mean, mainstream media, if we're thinking about pop culture, popular culture, you know, of course, I mean, you know, I was in high, I'm dating myself again, I was in high school when school days came out, right? And so remember the 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 um the 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 two groups of ladies, right? I do. Okay. I do. All right. And so you had um you had that kind of situation and in in the, the true, but that's true. So Spike Lee did that job with the movie Amazing Movie, but that so he's capturing a latter part, but we're talking about the late 1800s though in the late White. 1800s, you do have you do have some colorism and in fact one of the things that and i read this just today um um a another amazing woman um from that period is a woman named nanny helen burroughs in fact um your friend did a did her master's thesis on yeah. burroughs right i was i was on her committee and um but nanny burroughs um that was one of the things she she was told in DC she couldn't get a job uh, teaching because she was too dark, right? And this is the same DC where Mary Church Terrell worked, right? Uh, this is the same DC. The same, the same DC to some degree that was considered more progressive when you've compared them to other American cities. Mm -hmm. But now this is also the same DC that had a, a Howard University that you know, at one point, you know, if you, you we're talking about early 20th century, you know, one of the, one of the, 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 you know, kind of negative um, things that you, you, you always heard is that whole paper bag test, right, um, to get into um, organizations. And so one of the things that, yeah. Is that proof to that, Dr. White? Uh, yeah, there, there was, yeah, that's not a myth that, that did happen in some societies that, you know, if you were, um, darker than a paper bag, you know, you weren't going. So that's, you know, people can say, cause you know, there are folks who want to make, you know, uh, not all stories are going to be positive and not everything is going to be, you know, hunky dory and, 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 and sunshine and rainbows. Um, that, that was real. Um, you know, uh, what's the saying? Um, if you, if you like, you're all right. If you Brown stick around, if you black get back. Right. Um, that, that is, you know, part of the, that that's always been a part of black popular culture. And that's been for a long time. You know, we talk about these resurgences and team light skin and team dark skin, but that's, that comes out of, um, that also comes out of that period where people, you know, um, there were in many cases, um, the earlier folks who, who were fair, fair, fair were, you know, of course, in many cases, um, coming out of slavery, anyways, they were the children of the slave of the enslaver, right? And, and in many cases, the, the enslavers sent those kids to college, and okay. so you, you have an early, you know, um, um, you have some of those folks amongst that early um, African American educated um, African American elite. So this, um, okay, so it, it okay. would be true to say, in some instances, based off of that the opportunity for education over others sort of maybe platform them to a different uh, area in society, and, even among African-Americans. And, and there are, I mean, there have been studies to show that people do, uh, people have, not do, have, you know, favored um, lighter skin Black people over um, darker skin Black people. And people have, you know, um, people have different ideas about um, darker skin black people I, you know I, I, I'm gonna say my mother my mother was a child of the 50s and 60s and that was always uh, one of the things that we talked about um, from her um, um, childhood you know uh, people would say to her you know you a pretty little black girl right because uh, my mother's a, a, an attractive lady right mm -hmm. um, oh you're pretty for a black girl you know 
um, or, or things like that. And, you know, my, um, but my, my grandmother and my mother are brown skin. My, my grandmother was, and my mother is, you know, they, they were brown, you mm -hmm. know, darker brown complected women. Um, but, and so they were very conscious about that when they were raising, what I love about them is that they were very conscious about that when they were raising their girls and making us understand that, yeah. um, you know, we, we're not playing the color game that, you know, you know, little brown Tara is just as pretty as, you know, light skin, whatever. We, we're not playing the light skin, dark skin game. Um, and they never did, but they, they wanted me to understand that it did exist, you know, right. that, and I think I, I, I appreciated them for letting, you know, not allowing me to grow up in this little fantasy bubble and, and assume that there that wasn't an issue. And, you know, colorism is still, <sighs> colorism is, you know, and there's some people who still have stuff. And, and it's, I Let me say that as an adult, I have had experiences. With, that's, it, I, women. I, I'm gonna say in 2021, well, that's very unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. I do um, obviously believe you. Obviously, you, we hear these things, and, and thank you for putting it in in context of history. In terms of colorism among women or African Americans in general, and tonight we're talking about African American women as we begin to wrap up this pivoting conversation with the one and only acclaimed historian, Dr. Tara White. Do you have an idea? And, and I have some ideas in my head, but historically speaking, when colorism geared or, or its ugly head up because we know when African when Africans come over, we know the enslavement, right? Um, here in the states, and not to say there were not ones before here prior, because we've seen some research and some merchants, but overwhelmingly majority, we can all agree based off the history books, um, that it was through enslavement. That does it happen? And you mentioned before, you said Shana, there are African American women who work in the house, right? They could have been a dressmaker, they could have worked domestics, they could have taken care of the children. Um, of the individuals that own that property, or they could have been more in outside doing other work. Is, is that where we start to see some division and from the raping of women, African women, that we start, does it emerge then as the children come out with different complexions? I'm trying to get a hold of the time frame. Do you know? Okay, and so what I will say um, is, you know, the colorism, some, some of it is really about, you know, uh, the lighter complexion the person is, it's the, you know, it's really proximity to the slave owner, right? Okay. Um, okay. You know, this person is closer to white and, and so forth. Um, and, and that's, that's very real in, um, in, in enslaved communities um, that, you know, the lighter, you know, uh, and especially uh, children of the slave master. Um, depending on the slave master, they actually might have special privileges and special um, opportunities um, that other um, ch other you know black children don't. And like I said, um, there are you know uh, plenty of examples of slave masters who send their children, their their um, children from the enslaved women, off to college and 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 allow them to be educated and whatever. Um, you know it. Uh, <sighs> Sometimes, you know, that, that it's hard to say. It's not because I don't want to generalize. Okay. So um, there are situations where you will have the lighter skin women in the house, but, you know, in many cases, those, they the slave owners children. <laughs> they the slave owners children. Right? And would that be That's a case right of what we know about? Out. Would that be the case of what we know of Queen, the story that, you know, obviously Alex Taylor. If I'm not mistaken, because it's been a while. And so if I'm not mistaken, I think that that was the case that, that you know, she was slave owner's child. And so, of course, you know, she's going to end up with a, with a different, um, have a different lot. Um, but I, I, I want to, to note that, you know, a lot of these women um, are... <sighs> You know, women are, even as we go into the late 1890s, you know, and I talked about, you know, these women like Wales and Church Terrell and, yeah. and Washington, you know, knowing that they had a common 
th a common um, identity with um, these um, um, working women and washer women and the, the domestics and the um, um, women who work the fields and, and that kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, those women are very um, class conscious in, 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 other, in, in other cases they were, you know, and- um, How so? Well, I will say this, you know, one of the bills, one of the, the conversations that's happening, like right as um, Plessy was decided and when Plessy versus Ferguson, which um, um, declared that separate facilities um, um, were, were legal as long as they were equal. So separate facilities for whites and blacks were legal, were constitutional as long as they were equal. So the separate but equal kind of, that's, that's where you get that. Um, and so Homer Plessy was like, and, 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 and his case, he, he was a, like, he looked white. I showed my students a picture of Homer Plessy and they were like, wait a minute. So how did the white man end up in the segregated? I was like, he's, he's not white, y'all. What do you mean he's not white? We looking at the man, you know. But anyways, I had to had to get him. No, guys, he he's like he's he's mixed. He's a mixed race. But you know, during this time, people are trying to police the color line, okay. and so they have to make sure that you're on one side or the other. There's no such thing as biracial back then. You were either black or white. So if you you had as they say one drop of black blood, you're black, no matter how white you look. Wow. So that, and I thank you for putting that in context because when you said there were those who felt a need to pass that could, That's why I, I think that, that, that helps explain some of the context. Again, we're not saying right or wrong. They, they made that decision at that time. And you make, you paint a very good picture of the brutality that African-Americans faced. Okay. So we can only imagine why people may have wanted to do that. I'm saying it's right, but you're saying there was not like now you can check African-American, non-Hispanic, you know, or biracial, you're saying that that, if that was not taking place in the 1800s. In the latter part of 1800s, you were black or you were white. There, there was no acknowledgement of a biracial child. No, no, because now again, how do I, how do I police, how do I police now if, if I'm, if I'm creating laws and I'm setting up a system of, of, se of segregation, right? And so there has to be a colored <laughs> and there has to be a white and you got to be clearly in one of those camps. You can't be straddling the, you, you, you can't straddle the fence. I, you know, you can't go into the colored bathroom one day and the white bathroom the next day. And, you know, no, you had to be in one camp or the other. So this was really about. So let, me, let me ask you this. And this is another question, maybe more sociology based, but as a historian, you, you can answer this. So by doing that, and you make a point like they, it was one or the other, but by doing that, is there some sort of psychological also element that we're dealing with that that's not acknowledging that these women were raped, that, that these children are the product of that? Is that part of it? You know what? And, and, and that didn't happen. That, that's a really good point. That, that is a really good point. Now, let me say this too, because, you know, one of the beauties of history and one thing that makes history a little bit difficult is that you know we want to say everything is and everything isn't because now there were some situations where there were consensual relationships between black women and white men and vice versa okay but that way let me let me let me play devil's advocate now just for one second as a journalist not as a historian. So I've heard that, right? And, and we know there's a, a very famous story of Sally Hemmings and Thomas Jefferson. I'm sure as a, a historian, you knew not that. that. Not that, not that. But, but correct, correct. But, but let's, let's go there and, and venture more. When people, when you use the word consensual, I, I, the only thing I think of is we know on jobs today, there are rules that, that really disallow and encourage no dating or, or romantic interest between someone that's a subordinate and someone that's in charge and authoritative uh, position. I, I go back to slavery. I go back to systemic racism. It's very live and prevalent during this time of the late 1800s. And when we use the word consensual, now real talk for real people, I'm thinking as a woman, how consensual was it, even if, we, if, if our version of it is not what we think of brutal rape, but rape is to rape, 
it's against her will. But if he's in charge and she has no control over her body, as you described beautifully for us at the beginning, I, I do push back on the word consensual a little. I, I think maybe it's in a context that's not really fair to those women of that time. So let's 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 separate the groups because okay. now you're talking Sally Hemmings, who was clearly enslaved, because you're talking, you know, um, late. 1700s early but Thomas 80s. Jefferson was his friend. They're still enslaved, so he owns her. So she has no she has no um say in this in this deal. I mean, and and no matter how you try to say, well, she could, you know, um, you know, there's some agency. No, she no, no, none, none. There was a a, a steep power differential there, right? And, and the case you just made. Um, and so that's not, no, that's, there is no consensual when you own me and I belong to you. Yeah, correct. However, however, when we're talking the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, cause like I said, my dad, <laughs> my daddy swore that that one was white and he don't know how uh, they ended up together. Okay, in Lowndes County, Alabama, but uh, my great, uh, oh God, how many greats Jane was? Um, yeah, great. She had to be great, great, or great, great, great wow. grandmother, right? Yeah. With with that black man, yeah, for real, for real. And and like I said, my daddy was like, I baby, I don't know how to just 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 if you, you'd have to know my daddy god rest his soul um baby i don't know how they did that in Lowndes county but yeah that pretty much was how that was going so um yeah for real so there were some situations where people had consensual um um you know mixed race situations now of course the laws didn't recognize their marriage right oh wow um, whether they meant you know but Come on, Alabama had common law up until about four, well, what is this, 2020? Up until about two or three years ago, you could still be common law married in Alabama. So anyways, uh, <laughs> you just live long, you live together long enough, y'all, husband and wife. But uh, she, uh, yeah, yeah, there were situations, there were relationships, there were there were and so it's as historians you learn to not say there was absolutely no never because you come across stuff and you're like okay i gotta call my professor of blah 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 because yeah. they didn't talk about this right here because i'm looking at something that's anomaly an anomaly mm -hmm. but we're talking about human beings okay and human beings you can expect almost anything from Wow. Such a great conversation. You're watching Let's Talk America Radio. I'm on air host and executive producer, Shana Thornton, and I am uh, wrapping up a powerful, enlightening, uh, lively discussion about African-American women and their role and impact in the late 1800s. We had the right guest tonight, the one only acclaimed historian, uh, Dr. Tara White. Dr. White, uh, you've enlightened so much, um, some uncomfortable topics, but we address them. And I think it only makes us wiser um, and more inspired to uh, make a difference in our communities when we truly understand the context of so many things that we see even today. As we wrap up this conversation, it's been in-depth and awesome. And I do encourage you, if you're watching us, please share this on your page on Facebook. It will also be loaded to YouTube because it's a great conversation, it's educational, and please allow youth to watch this as well. And we are wrapping up Black History Month, but of course, uh, we encourage you, and I know Dr. White, you would say as well, continue to know the history of African-Americans um, all year round and others, because it only makes you more knowledgeable um, and savvy, if you will, a you move forward in life. But I have to ask you this final question um, for tonight. Um, you've covered so much tonight and you and I uh, really only talked about the last few decades of the 1800s. Um, you did point out yourself that there are more um, African-American historians that are coming out more and more. I don't think where we need to be, but it's, it's coming. You're saying um, more books are being written. Um, there, there may be 
uh, thousands out there watching us that's saying, well, I heard her mention these college books and talking about these topics, but I've never heard of these books, right? And maybe some of these people have gone to college and maybe some of them have not. Um, but you and I both know a lot of times it goes by what you take up in college as well, right? There are, there are preliminary classes we have to take, but a lot of the in-depth of certain parts of history are not promoted or pushed if you have a finance major or if you're a science major, it just varies. If you're a liberal arts school, you're not in a liberal arts school. Um, but as a black historian that happens to be an amazing female as well, what would be your lasting words for those that saying, wow, I, I, I was not aware of the role of African-American women, not really aware of everything they had to go through because you described some, some tough situations um, of that typical African-American woman in Charleston, South Carolina in 1860, right? On the brink three years before Emancipation Proclamation. We didn't even talk about the ones in Texas that didn't find out till later where we celebrate Juneteenth. We're gonna have to bring you back on to talk about that. Um, but tell us right now is, is so much is going on in the world. And so many people are saying, was well, this topic, is that topic, is this month, is that theme that's going on? How important is it for us to be aware of the plight of African-American women and how it promotes all of us, not just if we're women, if we have sons and nephews and cousins and brothers and fathers, how the role of the African-American woman really impacts everybody and obviously in the right way in a positive manner. You know, one of the things that I've, I've noticed and I've, I've, I've um, a, a quote, Nanny Helen Burroughs, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs, um, one of the things that she um, said, and this was, um, and I think um, um, Darlene Clark Hine, uh, one of my favorite uh, Black women historians, uh, I think Dr. Hine actually um, used this as a book title. She said, we specialize in the holy impossible. And that's what Black women do. And that's what Black women have done um, from the uh, from the enslavement period and, and you know, trying to keep those um, ties to our families, to um, uh, the post-enslavement period where, you know, reconstruction period where we are, you know, mobile and, and in many cases looking for not only more opportunities um, to live a better life, um, looking for opportunities to be reunited with our families, uh, but also looking for opportunities to, um, um, to, to live independent, right? Um, to the you know, early um, years of organized life where we helped to sustain communities, you know, regardless of whether we were educated or not, you know, black churches, uh, we, we helped to fundraise, you know, uh, a, a lot of those things that, that are holdovers, all of us who are from the South, you know, you, 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 gone to chick fish fries and and fried chicken and bought fried chicken dinners to raise money for the church um so those are holdovers from that to raising money for our organizations for our hbcus yeah. for our um, um colleges and our universities and our schools and our um hospitals um raising money for our organizations like the naacp right um to make sure that we were given a fair shake um, to our sororities and our fraternities from, you know, uh, the women who, you know, I, 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 I um, do give props to the ladies who founded a Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. I, you know, um, they, they love to tell me they're first and I say, yep, you are. And, um, and, and we came second. Uh, but anyways, and, um, you know, it, AKAs, the Deltas, the Sigma Gamma Rose, the Zeta Phi Betas, you know, those ladies have held it down. Yeah, and absolutely. And I know amazing women in all of those organizations. And those ladies are educated communities. Yep. They're um, teaching, they're nursing, they're, um, they have done all kinds of stuff. And these are the folks who have sent, sent children to school you know, they've sent plenty of their students off to college. They've given out, I don't know, millions and millions and millions of dollars in scholarships to folks, you know, going off to college. They've mentored. And, 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 and in many cases, this is, a, this is what, what, what Black scholars would, and especially Black women scholars would call that unpaid labor 
of mentoring, right? On campus, you, you, everybody's mama, you are their uh, counselor, you're their instructor, you might be, inter you know, interfacing with their parents. I, I can't tell you how many parents I know of my students. <laughs> and, and have talked to the parents because the students going through some drama, whatever. So, you know, Black women, we have specialized in the holy impossible. We've been the Black backbone of the church, even when we could not carry the word ourselves. Hallelujah. And, you know, Dr. Henry Louis Gates just wrapped up uh, an amazing series talking about African-American church. We're going to have to bring you back on. But as you close out, if you would emphasize the role of African-American women in the church in the history, the long history of the church. We have done a, a, an amazing, like I said, we've been the people who have, um, have, have raised up the churches. One of my great grandmothers, um, one of the churches here in, in Montgomery, um, Beulah Baptist. Beulah Baptist is well known, um, well known among the people who are ASU, you know, that ASU group, because, you know, ASU had its early classes at Beulah, but my great grandmother, great, 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 great or great, great grandmother, you know, was one of the people they had, um, they met at her house, right? Wow. Uh, Grandma Peterson. If I'm not mistaken, it was Alberta, one of the Albertas. But anyways, yeah, they met at our house and they were um, uh, on my morale side. And they, they actually helped to found Beulah Baptist Church out of her house. So, they, you know, this is the stuff that women are doing. They're, like I said, they're raising the money. They are um, making sure that the pastors are taken care of and the pastor's wives are taken care of. Um, they're singing in the choir. They're taking up the offering. They're, you know, ushering. They're, they're doing, they're doing it all. You know, and 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 I don't I don't do them justice. You have two historians who do an amazing job of of talking about the work of Black women in the church. One is Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Dr. Higginbotham is the president of Asala, um, the Association for the Study of African American African American Life and History, uh, and um, she's the chair of the history department at Harvard. Dr. Um, um, Higginbotham um, wrote um, Righteous Discontent and looked at the, the Black Baptist women, right? Um, and so uh, she's one of those women who uh, just just um, did an amazing job of showing what just how central Black women were to these churches. The other um, um, person is Dr. Betty Collier Thomas, who did a, a, an opus um, for real. I mean, seriously, it, 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 it is it is amazing um, piece of work called Jesus Jobs and Justice. So she looked at the work of black women and in, in churches, but how it intersected with, you know, just practical things like jobs, you know, black women, black men need jobs, <laughs> right? Black women, black men need 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 yeah. justice, right? And so that 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 real work, real world. Those real world kinds of needs and kinds of issues um, are, are played out. And it's church women in many, many cases who, who are, are, are working those. And it's not just Baptist women. She talked about Methodist women. She, you know, um, talked and, and, and women in CME churches and other, other churches. Yeah. So she, she did, did an amazing job. And so um, Black women, again, we are, we have been, um, we have done an amazing work and, and there's still much, much more, oh, yes. but Today. we were central, you know, to the, the maintenance and the survival of black communities. Yeah. We were central. Yeah. I, I, and if we will wrap up, um, such a great conversation. Um, just want to mention one quick thing to you. And we did get some feedback. Um, some individuals out of Atlanta said it was very, um, disturbing, um, how, um, they believe that uh, even today, some African Americans continue to internalize the racist ideologies about skin color. I'm um, referencing when you spoke earlier about colorism in the late 1800s among African American women. So we do um, acknowledge your comment there. Did want to feed that back to our exclusive guest, Dr. Tara White, the one and only acclaimed historian who has just enlightened us. But I wanted to end on this note. I was recently watching a special on PBS, and I heard someone they were talking about the civil rights movement, and in particular of the 50s 
and 60s. And they had said something I rarely heard people say, um, but when I sit down with great historians like you, um, they do reveal it, but it has not been said mainstream and here it is on a mainstream station. Um, this individual had said sexism was very much alive and well um, throughout the civil rights movement. This is what this person said, and she had participated in it. And she said it, it was among um, the civil rights groups. Um, regardless, she said, even if it was the more traditional ones that had been, you know, um, from slick to the others, to the more militant ones as we approach the late 60s and early 70s. And she said, very few people are talking about that. But she said that there was not a value, her opinion, of women and they were not regarded perhaps as sometimes Hollywood has this sort of showing or depiction. Very quick as we wrap up in the less than one minute. Um, do you agree with her? Because we talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about so much that came from it, but um, did African-American women get the respect and the value? Because we think about Rosa Parks and her part and many others. I mean, we, we can go on and on, Mayor I mean, we, we can go on and on. But do you believe, I see you shaking your head, so obviously you do agree with this. Well, Parks, I will say that Parks, um, for for her time, Parks was because you know Parks and her husband were a team um, yeah. doing a lot of what they did, and 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 Edie Nixon. If you look at the the records here, um, Edie Nixon, who was the branch president um, here for a long time, had a tremendous amount of respect for Mrs. Parks, tremendous amount. Um, some of the other women, no. I mean, um, let's take Ella, Ella Josephine Baker. I was going to name my children, one of my children after her. Um, but Ella Josephine Baker, um, an amazing woman, did not get half of the uh, accolades and half of the respect that she um, deserved. And part of that was because she was a woman. She was actually the very first director of the SCLC, right? But because she was a woman, right? Yeah. Because she was a woman, um, she she was like, I'm not a, I'm not a man and I'm not a preacher. And, you know, these men don't really want to um, listen to me. And so she's, she's later on replaced by uh, Y2 Walker. Okay. And, um, but that's because they they respect Wyatt because Wyatt's a man and he's a preacher, and so um, that's that's but that's that's a, an issue, and that's an issue in SNCC. That's one of the things that leads to you know towards the end a, a, a bigger kind of um, well kind of a, a, a split in in some and in fact what you see with the with many of the white women who leave SNCC is that they go and become a part of the the third leg of the women's movement um and, and that's yeah you you, you yeah mm -hmm. a lot of those women end up in the women's movement um in the 1960s and 70s um and and some black women too because they recognize also um that you know gender is an issue but what they realize is that before gender, you know, black women more than anything else, they realize that before gender, race is the issue. The other thing is, um, I love this quote by Fannie Lou Hamer uh, talking about her her husband, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing, but she talked about how, you know, the, the new women are talking about women's lib and being liberated from their men. She said, I got a man, he's six foot four with a size 14 shoe that I don't want to be liberated from. <laughs> and, you know, and so people had various ideas about, hey, I, I ain't met with her. Uh, I, she, people had varying ideas about what uh, they, you know, what the, the, the women's liberation um, um, movement was about in okay. the 70s. And there were, you know, for Black women especially, you, you knew that what people saw first was not your gender, that they saw um, your race first. But you also knew that there were fights that you had because you were a woman. And so um, you had, you did have uh, quite a few women. You did have women enter into the um, into the women's liberation movement, black women, um, because they they did. There were um, gains to be made there as well. So. Wow. Yes, I mean, such a 
a great conversation. Thank you for uh, addressing that one last question because when she said it, I said, it's not really said a lot. Um, yeah, I think that part of history is often left out, but I think you said something that was so true, Dr. White, that we also have to talk about the uncomfortable topics of African-American history. And we have to um, recognize there were painful periods and, and a lot of that trauma that comes from the history of really any group um, has to be acknowledged because it, it gives you a fair assessment, a truthful assessment of what occurred. Because it's not just what's written in the books, right? Right. These are real people. It's not, you know, they were slaves, move on. No. What did slavery encompass? What did it do to a generation of people, right? How, how, how does it affect the child? The mother of the child who's seeing her children ripped from her arms and never to see them again, wondering whatever happened to them. Um, and the father as well. So it's it's so important. Thank you so much for having this very important conversation. One that uh, has so many different dynamics to it. Obviously one episode of Let's Talk America Radio cannot capture the essence of the history of African-American women. But tonight we tried to dig one hole into it because because as we covered the later latter part, of 1800s. We did that. We had the right guests. And we will continue to have this conversation about African-American women and the African-American experience in the United States. We're going to seek the best and the brightest. And we already have her. It's our in-house African-American historian, the one and only Dr. Tara White. We're going to have you back on. We're going to continue this. It has been an amazing conversation. Um, it inspired me. I know it inspired those who are giving feedback. They're saying great conversation. Um, they were inspired. Thank you so much for your information. As always, where can our viewers and listeners um, find out more information about you if they just want to send you a quick question, maybe about genealogy or what this means when they're reading a, a letter, perhaps from great, great grandpa, what was he referencing? Um, I know we, we kind of see you as an all around expert, but how can they connect with you? Um, my email address is, is Dr. Tara White, D-R period T-A-R-A White at gmail.com. Awesome. Keep it going. Thank you for all that you're doing. Um, we'll have you back on and stay safe, okay? Thank you. You too. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for watching another episode of Let's Talk America Radio. I hear we continue to deliver um, the news, the information, the topics, the chats you want to have, even if they make us uncomfortable, it only makes us more knowledgeable. And with knowledge, we can certainly move forward and make the best life here at this moment and a promising tomorrow. I'm Shana Thornton signing off. For more information, visit ltaradio.com.